الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما ورزقنا فهم النبيين وحفظ المرسلين اللهم افتح إلينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام وصل اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الكرام ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome إن شاء الله we can get started We'll start with the hikam from number 32. There are a few things in this uh, collection that we'll do today, which I'm going to sort of embed into the theme of the logic that we're going to look at. And it's a very, very integral, very important piece. If you grasp this concept, then Inshallah, the rest of the text that we'll do in logic is going to be very smooth and very easy to understand because the rest is now getting into the semantics of logic. But you understand the actual essence of how the mind functions and how we interact with reality. How has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala designed this intellect of ours that we are able to, to understand, we are able to comprehend so let's look at the hikam first, and then we'll start on the text itself, and then I will try and explain these, this concept uh, in more detail. So he says, number 32. <clears throat> Tashawuf, this aspiration of yours, this longing for the ambition the real goal and objective to look for what is within you from the ayub from the shame from the vices those things that besmirch you is much better than your anticipation to look for what is concealed or hidden among the unseen to look for what is within you insofar as your shortcomings and your vices, the things that bring you shame. See, dhalimun li nafsi is ultimately the only dhulm that an individual can do. The dhulm of the human being is li nafsihi. Ultimately, you don't affect other things per se. You don't affect Allah. You don't bring any harm upon Him. Though you may cause uh, damage to other things and ruin other things, but ultimately, that dhulm boils down to you having done it upon yourself. That's what wrongdoing is. That's why it's called ghalimun li nafsihi. And so if you look, Adam and Hawa, the dua that they made, Rabbana dhulamna anfusana. Even though they disobeyed Allah's commandment, dhulamna anfusana. We did dhulm on ourselves. Injustice is on ourselves. We, we did it on ourselves. And what happened when they took from the tree, when they ate from the tree, their shame was exposed to them. If you look at some of the translations, they talk about their nakedness was explained, exposed to them. It's not their nakedness that was exposed to them. Uh, we, we are aware, we are very well aware of our nakedness, our aura. Every individual is aware of their aura. What was exposed to them was their shame, because you've got two aspects. When when wrongdoing is committed, it's either a guilty conscious or a shameful conscious. In Islam, there is a balance between the two when it comes to the Sharia, but there is a greater emphasis on the shame 
rather than the guilt of committing a sin or a crime. In the Western world, there is less of shame, rather now there is no shame whatsoever, and more emphasis on the guilt of it. So the, the mindset is typically, as long as I'm not doing anything illegal, as long as I'm not doing anything wrong, so you do the action. It all is based on the legality or illegality of it, from which if you commit the crime, you are either innocent or guilty of it. So it's a guilt-based society. And unfortunately, Muslims see their own Sharia in the same way. We look at our own Sharia in terms of the prohibitions of it. As long as I'm not doing anything wrong, that's not how the Muslim should be. That the believer does not go through life in terms of obedience or disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based on the guilt of it. So only if you feel guilty is when you actually acknowledge that you're doing something wrong. Rather, it's based on shame. Do you have shame? You know, so Adam and Hawa, this is what they felt. They disobeyed their Lord, their creator, their nurturer, the one who brought them into existence, the one who gave them this na'ma. They disobeyed him. And that's that's what they are shameful of. We are shameful of disobeying you. This is what Ibn Atayla is saying. It is better for you to look for these things within you rather than trying to look for the mystical aspects of reality. Now, here is a Sufi master, a real Sufi, who is talking about the very thing that most people of Sufia end up going astray into. They end up doing the wrong thing. And he he's an individual whom <clears throat> the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'a, Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'a, collectively acknowledges to be a spiritual master, whatever denomination they might acknowledge, uh, associate with him. You see, even the Salafia or the most staunch Salafi, uh, you know, the, the modern, like the whatever they're called, they have to acknowledge someone like Ibn Atayullah. He's saying that the real path, because last week we spoke about Suluk, the one who is on the pathway, and there are two types of people on the pathway. He's saying that the real one, the real seeking of this path is for you to look for what is wrong with you rather than trying to get amazed by the reality around you. <clears throat> because ultimately, what is it that you're looking for? You're looking for the absolute. You're looking for the one who is the most real. You're looking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he says then, Al-Haqqu laysa bi mahjubin. Al-Haqq. Allah is al-haq, is not veiled. There is no veil on al-haq. The truth has no veil on it. وَإِنَّمَا الْمَحْجُوبُ أَنْتَ عَنِ النَّظَرِ إِلَيْهِ Rather, the one, the only one who is veiled is you. You're the one who is veiled from it. And veiled because of what? Veiled because of these things. These blemishes are what are veiling you from the truth. <clears throat> See, Iblis was arrogant. That arrogance is what was exhibited and it stems from the root of it in his heart was the, the jealousy and pride as the disease or, or what was diseasing his heart. That's what was veiling him from the truth. It was preventing him from knowing, from understanding. That's why the question that was asked to him, Ma manaka? You see, Allah did not ask, why didn't you prostrate? He asked, what prevented you from prostrating? Is amratuka, when I gave the command to you, or from prostrating before that which I created with my own hands, there can be nothing more magnificent than that, than what God does. So how is it that you were not able to see that reality, that truth? What prevented you? It was the diseased heart. The blemishes on the heart. So it's the human being who is veiled from the truth. Allah is not the one who is veiled from you. If there was something that was veiling him, then it would be covering him. It would cover him. If, it, if there was something veiling him, then it would be covering him. لَكَانَ لِوُجُودِهِ حَاصِرٌ And then that would end up putting a limitation on him. 
وَكُلُّ حَاصِرٍ لِشَيْءٍ فَهُوَ لَهُ قَاهِرٌ And anything that has, has upon it a limitation, then that limitation has power over it. And yet the Qur'an says, وَهُوَ الْقَاهِرُ فَوْقَ عِبَادِهِ He is the one who is overpowering above all of his servants. Aqil wa ghair aqil. The animate and the inanimate. He is the one who is all, pow all powerful over all of his subjects. So how can there be a, a limitation on him? How can there be a veiling on him? So this is logic if you want to look at it. He's giving you a logical statement in here. You see, he's telling you this and this is how it is. Because if it was like this, then it would be like this. And how can it be like that if this is what the truth is saying? The mutabaqa. According to what the Quran is saying, Allah is most powerful above all of his creation. So how can there be a cover on him? Or how can he be veiled? Because if he was veiled, there would be a cover on him. And if there was a cover on him, there would be a limitation on him. And if there's a limitation on him, then that limitation is overpowering him. أخرج عن أوصاف بشريتك من كل وصف مناقض لعبوديتك. Depart yourself, exit from the characteristics of your humanness. الحيوان, the lower characteristics of your humanness. من كل وصف مناقض لعبوديتك. From every attribute. That is contradictory, and we're going to do a section on logic there. There's going to be a section after propositions, then there are contradictions. So we're going to look at that contradictions as well. And everything that is contradicting your servitude, anything that is coming in the way of you and your servitude, you want to separate from that, depart from that. Litakuna linida il haqqi mujiban. So that the call of truth, you can be, you can be receptive to it, or responsive to it. You can be responsive to the call of the truth of al haq wa min hadratihi qariban, and be close in his presence, in the presence of al haq Aslu kulli maasiyatin wa ghaflatin wa shahwatin. The source origin of every disobedience, every sin, every heedlessness, uh, foolishness, um, every appetite and desire, the source of it, the root origin of it, nafs, is what you would term as self-satisfaction. It's from the satisfaction of the self, not the heart. So somebody can feel happy. See, I'm feeling joyous. But... In truth, it's not the joy of the heart. It is more a joy of the self, a delight of the self. <laughs> and the source origin of every obedience, of every virtue and awareness or vigilance, this wakefulness, consciousness, the source of it. Conscious meaning conscious of the divine presence. The source of it, Adamu Rida Minka Anha, is from is is this is this is the lack of satisfaction from yourself. Is separating this. This is why we did when we when we did Kimia Saada, he Ghazali made it a point to make the central theme of his entire treatise is to say that there is a distinction between what you think is happiness and what real happiness is, i.e. what the self delights in and what the heart is truly content in. There is a distinction between the two. So the self-satisfaction is where the source of all this disobedience of heedlessness comes from. And your obedience and virtue is separation from that. To be able to, dis this is where you, you have to do it consciously. To be consciously aware of there being a distinction to do this firaq, the differentiation between what is worldly and what is otherworldly in terms of now the hereafter. What is it that the self is looking for and what is it that the heart truly desires? 
ولأن تصحب جاهلا لا يرضى عن نفسه خير لك من أن تصحب عالما يرضى عن نفسه It is better for you that you associate yourself with the ignoramus who is not self-satisfied rather than to associate with the knowledgeable one who is self-satisfied. Self it is better that you associate with an ignoramus who has no self-satisfaction than to associate with a big scholar, big name who is satisfied with himself. What's the logic behind that? He says, What knowledge is there to a, to a scholar who is self-satisfied? Because he's already put a limitation on himself. I'm happy with what I know. I'm happy with what I've uncovered. I'm happy with... So he's satisfied where he is. There is no more prompt. There is no more drive. There is no more passion to know more. You see, when we say things like, you know, learning has no end or, or, or learning is lifetime, you know, knowledge is, is lifetime. Seeking knowledge is a lifelong pursuit. These are not just slogans. That's the reality. There's only, there's only little that we actually know. You know, there's a very interesting, if you look at, if you ask any physicist, any physicist who actually knows what they're doing, there's, there's an interesting uh, problem in physics. The entirety of the of the universe. I mean, it's established that it is expanding and it is in an expansive state and the Quran attests that that's the truth. The universe is expanding. So every object in the universe, every planet, galaxy, star, it's moving outwards. Now, there are two forces that are applied here in physics. There is the force that is pushing everything separating everything and then there is a counter force that is keeping that push in a balance because it's space right so there's no friction so if everything's moving then it should have already gone off completely you know entropy infinitum the rate of expansion is what physicists are not able to solve because this force that is pushing everything out this is what they call dark matter and it constitutes somewhere around, um, I'm not really sure of the actual statistic there about the, the actual percentage. I believe it's about 80% or 75% of, of the universe. It's dark matter. Now, what is dark matter? It's something that we cannot see, we cannot observe, we cannot measure. We just know it to be there because it's the only thing that makes sense insofar as this separation. Everything is being pushed aside. And the universe is expanding and the counter force to that is somewhere around 15 percent thereabouts it's not overwhelming so that it maintains the the universe is at a standstill but it is underwhelming that outward force so that the expansion continues but it continues at a controlled rate and this is what keeps our perception of time to be to be the way it is otherwise things would be moving too fast you know you know planets would be breaking apart and stars would be exploding and imploding all over the place now these two forces we don't know what they are no one in physics knows what they are this these two forces or these two are what constitute somewhere in the range of 95 96 percent of the physical observable universe that we know and 96 percent of that universe we don't know what it is which means Insofar as what we know of this physical reality constitutes only 4% or 5%. We only know about 4 to 5% of this physical universe. Isn't that amazing? That we only know this much. And yet you find all these arrogant people who will act like they know everything about everything. Uh, every Kullu Dibbin Wahibbin Yatakalla wants to speak because they can creep and crawl. Know everything about everything, know every fact. Yet all our collective knowledge, cumulative human knowledge from the first to the last human being or up until the present, we only know about 5% of this universe that we occupy and no amount of instrumentation or telescopy or any, any external entity can enable us to arrive at a further understanding of that. It is purely abstract and conceptual. 
And this is why Einstein said that the only thing that I find incomprehensible about this universe in which we are also occupying is its comprehensibility in the fact that we can know it that we can know because there are known knowns there are known unknowns there are unknown unknowns and then there are unknown knowns and these are all part of epistemology even that 96 percent that we don't know what it really is we know it is in, 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 in a concept that it is there you see we don't know what infinity is and yet we know that it is there as a concept we can conceptualize it so how can there be a limitation to what you know in that you'd have got no further probe of reality? You're no longer trying to draw answers from your reality to ultimately arrive at the ultimate truth itself, which is al-haq is what you're looking for. How is it that you are no longer interested in that? This is what you call the scholar who is self-satisfied because he's a scholar on a path of seeking knowledge and he's satisfied with what he has. He's no longer pushing. He's no longer probing reality. And that's indicative of being psychologically dead. A psychological death has occurred there because the mind is always active 24 seven. It's always active when you're awake or when you're asleep, your body might be asleep. Your mind is always active. It is always probing reality and that's how it functions. It functions fundamentally by probing reality, by asking, not by receiving. It is always asking. Whichever medium it will use to ask, whether it utilizes the eyes to observe or the ears to pick up sound, it is always in the mode of asking. It is always active. It's never passive. And so if you don't have this, this probing, you know, if you don't have a question to ask, always, you know, you, you, you need to have, be ready to ask the next question, to always be ready to ask the next question. This is what you find in children. Children are always ready to ask the next question. Why is that? Why is that? But how does he do this? How does he do that? Why is that? And it keeps going on and on and on and on. Adults, we sort of, let that go we lost our 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 childlike behavior and then we adopted childish behavior so we're now becoming self-satisfied self-entitled foolish people to walk this earth <laughs> we lost our we, lo we lose our innocence the same innocence that children have they're always ready to ask the next question that inquisitiveness is what keeps the mind in a healthy state because the mind always wants to ask question and probe reality. Now, of course, you have to ask the right questions in order to get the right answers. But the fact of the matter is you need to always be ready with a question to probe reality. Otherwise, the mind is going to regress and is going to dumb down. It's going to quiet. And then you become suppressive onto yourself. This is Dali Mulli Nafsi. There's nothing more for you to understand. And by the way, this applies to also scholars in our tradition in, in Islam, Muslim scholars. They think that because they have recited the whole Quran, they memorized all the hadith and that's it. That's I'm alim now. This, this is the alim he's talking about here. What kind of alim is this who is satisfied with what he knows and doesn't want to probe further and understand more? It's better than you just associate with an ignoramus because he then says, What ignorance is there to an ignoramus who is not self-satisfied? Because so long as he's not self-satisfied, now self-satisfaction means what? Self-satisfaction essentially is stagnation in life. You see, I'm happy where I am. This is my comfort zone. You've got your bubble, your particle around you. I'm good. I can take out the next 40, 50 years like this. That is self-satisfaction. You're no longer in, a, in, a, in the process of motion. And that is contrary to the very fitrah of the human being because we are in a, in, in a world that is turbulating. It is a world of stillness and motion, but there always has to be stillness and motion, not just stillness. The self is always looking for stillness, wants tranquility, wants peace of mind wants to relax, wants comfort, does not want to get involved. These are the things that the self does. But 
you are in a reality that demands you to be in motion as well. So stillness and motion. So self-satisfaction is you looking only for stillness. You're looking for peace. We want peace only. Everlasting peace. Make the world a better place. There's, there's no peace in this world. Peace is relative. It is relative to war. And war is relative to peace. And this is why we negotiate peace treaties. If, it, if peace was absolute, we wouldn't need to negotiate on, on it because each individual has a different understanding of what peace entails. Anyway, different discussion. The point that he's trying to make is it is better for you to associate with that individual because due to his, his lack of self-satisfaction, though he's ignorant, that is going to drive him to keep probing further. And the more that he moves, the less, the more of his ignorance he sheds, the less ignorance he carries forward. It's better for you to associate with that than to find the guy who has already gotten the whole encyclopedia in his head, cannot offer anything more to you. Shu'a al-basirati yushhiduka qurbahu minka wa'aynu al-basirati yashhiduka adamaka li wujudihi wa haqqu al-basirati yushhiduka wujudahu la adamaka wa la wujudaka. Shu'a, the rays of intelligence, and when he's saying intelligence, he's meaning that inner intelligence, not book smart, inner intelligence or insight, basira. The rays of intelligence, they enable you to witness his proximity to you. This is the luminance of that intellection, the luminance of it. The eye of intelligence enables you to witness your non-being to his being. The eye of intelligence is the eye that is probing. That's the inquisitiveness. The ray of intelligence is, is that which is illuminating. It's the noor now. You, you're able to see. The eye requires light. Light does not come from the eye. Right? This is established in physics. It is established metaphysically as well. Light does not come from the eye. The light comes into the eye. The light illuminates the object, reflects off that object, enters the eye, and that is how you are able to see things. So the luminance is different from the organ, rather not the organ, the sense that is now probing into reality. So the probing of your intelligence is what enables you to acquire knowledge. And it is through that knowledge, as you keep going through every particular semantic, you keep unifying, 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 until you reach an understanding of the ultimate unity, which is al-haq. It puts you now in a state of realization of your non-existence in relation to his existence. Because though you're an existent being, we're all existent beings, we are aware from our very nature, our very fitra, we are aware of our existence. I am aware, I'm consciously aware that I am alive. I'm consciously aware that there's a reality around me. But I am not a being who brought himself into existence. I'm not a being who originated himself, nor am I a being who sustains himself. And so my existence is contingent on another existence, which itself is other than what my existence is. And so if my existence requires sustenance, then that existence does not require sustenance. If my existence requires uh, sleep and wakefulness, then that existence does not require sleep and wakefulness. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyul qayyum la ta'akhuduhu sinatun wa la no. He is not taken by sleep and drowsiness. You see? So my existence, by my probing of reality and understanding and acquiring this knowledge of knowing what I am and what this reality is, and then I ultimately come to understand the one who brought this reality into existence, it tells me that my existence in comparison is essentially non-existence in that I can be removed from existence and there's nothing I can do about it. I cannot prevent that. I can be removed from existence in an instant and I cannot do anything to prevent that. It's all in his hands. 
This is the eye of intelligence. This is what the eye of intelligence is ultimately going to seek. And then the truth of intelligence, what's now availed to the intelligence. So first is, is the luminance that enables you to see. And then there is the seeing itself. And then there is the conclusion you arrive at through that, which is the truth. So the truth of intelligence lets you witness his being now. Because you've already affirmed your non-existence in compared to him. So now you are witnessing his existence, which is not something you can read about in any book. This is something that you really have to, you, it is something that the, the prophets and the saints, this is what they ultimately arrive at in what he describes in the previous, uh, uh, one of the previous ones in which he talked about those who have arrived at his proximity and those who are still journeying towards him. So the truth of this, of intelligence now, of intellection, of what is derived from intelligence, the truth of it, the ultimate truth of it is his wujud, his absolute existence. Not your non-existence, nor your existence. Your existence and non-existence becomes a semantic matter when you finally realize that. Is what you finally come to realize. He was Allah and there was no thing with him. And he is now as he was then. This is a bit tricky because kana in Arabic uh, falls under a category called kana wa akhwatiha. And there's a group of words that relate to the state of things in time. So, so he is, he was, he will be, you see, she is, she was, she will be. These relate to created things. Because each thing in creation changes its state. Each thing is a relative. It changes its state from time to time, whether physical or metaphysical state. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is absolute. So it's not like he's in one state at one time, then another state at another time. No, he's absolute. And so kana, the word kana in Arabic grammar, when it is used with what's called lafzul jalala, the majestic word, which is Allah, and his attributes, the kana is not bound by time. So though you will find in translations, it will say, you see, kana Allahu, he Allah was, it actually should not be taken as he Allah was, because it would imply that he was, but he is not right now. And he may not be, or he may be at, in the future. There's a, you have to be careful with language there. And therefore, even something like the kalima, for example, La ilaha, the la there is part of kana wa akhwatiha, it is a negation. La ilaha illallah, it, the, the real meaning from that should be there was no ilah, there is no ilah, and there never will be any ilah illallah except Allah, not bound by time. Because if you take the straight literal translation, it says there is no God but God except Allah. Right? There is no God except Allah. Well, it could imply that there was one before, or there might be in the future more than one. You see? So it becomes kind of tricky. You have to understand this in its essence. That there, there was there was only, only Allah, and there will only be Allah. Everything else is semantic. The only true, the only real, the only absolute is He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why the Quran says, Laysa ka mithlihi shay'un. There is nothing like unto Him, even though there are attributes that you can associate with Him. Even though there are certain attributions, there is nothing like unto Him in speech, in word, in form, in concept, in any aspect, whatever you could conceive, He is not that. Let's stop here, inshallah, and um, 
yeah, we'll stop over here and actually, no, we can finish up this. Yeah, let's finish up here, the next three. He says then, la tata'addayanna. And I think in yours, it says, la tata'addayanna. La tata'addayanna. همتك إلى غيره فالكرم لا تتخطه الآمال. Don't let your ambitions, your your zeal, your aspirations, your passion extend to other than him. ليس كمثله شيء. There is nothing like unto him. So why would you put your aspirations in other things rather than that which is unique, the one, the true and absolute? Don't let it extend your aspirations to other than him. Because hopes and aspirations, they don't surpass the most gracious. He is the most merciful. He is the most gracious. He is the all-knowing. So what can you then compete against him? And why would you then pursue that rather than that which is, which is infinitum, which is eternal? لا ترفعنا إلى غيره حاجة هو موردها عليك Don't seek to alleviate from yourself to remove from yourself your needs and then give them to somebody else to try and solve them for you don't look for someone else to solve your problems for you that he Allah has placed upon you how can someone else alleviate what he Allah has originated and placed on you how can somebody else fix it for you? He is the one, Allah, who has put that problem on you. In other words, if you're going to seek for help, seek for help from him. You recite this every, every salah. Only you, only you. That iya is to isolate the kad, which is the pronoun. You and the iya is to isolate the you, meaning only you. Do we serve and worship? Only you do we ask for help. So how can somebody else solve your problem for you when he is the one who has put the problem in your path? Man la yastati'u an yarfa'a hajatahu an nafsihi fa kaifa yastati'u an yakuna lahu an ghayrihi rafi'an The one who cannot fix his own problems, how is he going to fix your problems? The one who cannot solve it, because that one has his own problems, and that one has his own problems, and that one puts looks for someone else to solve his problems, the other one looks for someone else, so they cannot solve their own problems. How are they going to fix your issues or your problems for you? Ultimate, what he's trying to say is, if you are going to seek for help, seek it from him and from no other. Now, that doesn't mean that you look for the means, because Allah has put the means for you to use to solve the problems for you. For you, to, for you to solve your own problems. He's put the means there for you. But in, in either case, you still need to seek his help in order for you to find the means and use the means appropriately. In lam tuhassin ghannaka bihi li ajli wasfihi. And in yours it says li ajli husni wasfihi. Same thing, it's just omitted in mine. إن لم تحسن ظنك بأجلي به أجلي حسن وصفه. If you have not improved or perfected your thought of him, your thinking of him, to the perfection of his attributes, فحسن ظنك به لأجلي معاملته معك. Then improve your thinking, your account, your opinion of him. On account of the treatment that he affords to you. Understanding the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not easy. It's not something that just comes like that. So just because you know the 99 names, you know all of Allah's attributes. No, really understanding them. What does it mean to be merciful, all merciful? What does it mean to be all benevolent? Really understanding them because these are the these are debates. Have been going on for centuries. Ilm al kalam is is part is 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 form was formulated in order to work this out among scholars because you know 
the deliberations on this can go on and on. It's not something that the mind can so easily grasp. So if you're not able to do that, that's fine. Formulate a, an opinion, a sound opinion of him, because he, Allah says in Hadith al-Qudsi, I am what my servant thinks of me. What, my, what opinion my servant holds of me, that's what I am to him. So if he thinks little of me, then that's all I am going to be to him. But if he thinks highly of me, then that's what I will be to him. So formulate your opinion based on how he is treating you, the favors that he's bestowed upon you, the ni'mah that he's given you. فَهَلْ عَوَّدَكَ إِلَّا حَسَنًا Is there anything that he's done for you or given you other than goodness? He brought you into existence. He sustained you. He's given you food. He's given you shelter. He's given you clothing. Yeah, maybe you don't have the same as what that other person has in terms of quantity, but he has sustained you. And it's only him who is sustaining you. Because if he wants, he can just take it out. He can extinguish your life within an instant. There's nothing you can do about it. وَهَلْ أَسْدَى إِلَيْكَ إِلَّا مِنَنًا And has he conferred upon you anything but favor? Has he, has he given you anything but favor? One of the pillars of Iman is belief in his Qadr. Good or bad in what he has destined for you. Meaning that both of those whether it's good from your perspective or bad from your perspective is a favor upon you. The good is there as a reward and the bad is there to motivate you to seek out the good or to act as a reminder for you to seek out his help. Ultimately, that's what he wants from his servant. He wants from his servant for his servant to turn to him, to turn back to him. So when Adam and Hawa were taking from the tree, when Iblis was doing all his pus 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 pus, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not intervene. He allowed the sharr to take place. He allowed it to happen. Why? So that Adam could then turn back to his Lord. And if you look at the ayat, if you look in Surah Baqarah, in Surah Al-Araf, in Surah Tawbah, it says, Adam turned to his Lord. He, he uses that word specifically. He turned to his Lord and then asked for mercy and forgiveness. That is an emphasis there. If you look at Sulaiman alayhi salam, when he was shown the vision of this terrifying entity on his throne. And then the ayah ends there and says, Thumma anab. Thereafter, he turned to his Lord. Because he saw something sharp. He saw something that was distressing, something that was troubling. He didn't try to fix it himself. He turned to his Lord, Rabbi Firli. First, I ask your forgiveness. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately wants from you. This is what Ibn Ata'illah is giving you the pointers of being on the path. To say that you are, you are, you are, you are doing tasawwub or taskiyah to nafs. You're purifying, you're on a spiritual path. These are the things that you're supposed to be doing. Not sitting with the light switched off and hitting your chest, doing Allah, Allah, Allah all night long. That's not, that's not tasawwuf, whatever that might be. That's something else. Real tasawwuf, this is what it entails. God consciousness, this is what it entails. Mm. Okay, so we'll stop there now, number 40. And because number 41, it looks like it's going into a different thing. So, inshallah, we'll do that next week, inshallah, from number 41. Alhamdulillah. What's our time? Okay, we went a bit overboard on time. All right, so let's do the, um, let's look at the Isaguji. Um, last week, we did the first the introduction of it. And we looked at the, the, the love, is what he starts off with. Now, there is a line that is in your text, is not there, it's missing. And so I have it with me here, and I'll read it from what I have. The first section there is the love. And he says, Allah do dal bil 
yadullu ala shay'in yadullu ala tamami ma wudi'a lahu bil mutabaqa the love the vocable word the uttered word is adallu has a signification it signifies a meaning bil wudi' by formulation yadullu ala tamami ma wudi'a lahu bil mutabaqa that indicates the entirety of the meaning by way of um, correspondence complete accord is what they've translated but that's what it means co correspondence what it corresponds with reality the uttered word is what's corresponding with reality now this word is different because the english doesn't give you that the love is different from the kalima love and kalima are different in arabic Though they are, they are synonymic and they can be used synonymically, but when you're speaking in terms of a science, specificity is demanded. So there is a difference between the two. Uh, and I'll come to explaining what that is. And by a partial accord, if it has got a part. And what it is uh, bound to in terms of its, its natural or its inherent quality that is bound, that binds it to the formulation in the mind by the term they've used here is concomitance, but to use a simpler term by necessity. So necessity, necessary is a technical term in logic as well. Concomitance is a bit more advanced in that. Then the line that is not there is is the example they have put the translation there but the arabic isn't there kal insan like insan like human if you use the word human fa innahu yadullu ala fa innahu yadullu ala al hayawan al natiq bil mutabaqa it has it is signifies or or if you use that it it would it would signify a rational animal by correspondence if you want to define what a human being is then the most concise definition of the human being the concise term is al hayawan an natiq the rational animal though they've used creature here but it shouldn't be creature it should be animal hayawan is animal so in its complete usage I can call a human being a rational animal. If I say rational creature or rational animal, then it should be known that I'm referring to the human being because there is no other animal that is rational. The human being is the only animal that is rational. So as a complete entity, I'm referring to the human being. Or I can use one of these two terms in part because both of these terms are part of the human being. He is an animal and he is rational. So rationality is part of the human being. And therefore, if I say rational, then you know I'm talking to the human, I'm talking about a human being. If I say animal, if I say he's an animal, then then I'm talking about the human being because the human being is an animal, is in the animal genus. And I can say has the ability to read um, and to write or the ability to acquire knowledge and to write by necessity because that's a necessary attribute of the human being. If I had a bunch of random things here and I point to one of them and say, this uh, thing that can read and write, well, out of all those other things, if there's only one human there, then by necessity, I'm associating or implying that I'm referring to the human being. I'm referring to the human being because the dog cannot read and write, the cat cannot read and write, the chair cannot read and write, the stone cannot read and write. So even though there are all these bunch of things and I say, bring me the one who can read and write, I am referring to the human being. 
so for example here is here is the object and this is this is the object if i was to say i am drinking from the cup i'm my drinking from the cup as a concept you know that I am drinking from the thing itself, the cup itself. I'm referring to this in its whole. If I say I'm drinking water, then I'm drinking water also implies within it that I'm drinking from the cup. Why? Because the water is in the cup. It's part of it. That's a partial association. So I'm drinking water. So if you read in a book, for example, that then says he took a sip of water, you can't see the action taking place you just read the words he took a sip of water the concept in the mind has already been formulated that he was drinking from a cup so the the sip of water is a partial accord to the whole object so these three aspects are what the loves entail the loves either refers to the whole thing as a whole or partially if it has got parts or by way of necessary attributions that which is necessary to that object and is inseparable from it so the what's by what's bound by it so let me read the um, the footnotes that they have given here and i'll try and explain it even better any name of a species indicates a creature of that species by complete accord such as human lion or bear etc a quranic example would be cow in the verse they put verse i come like in the ayah verily allah commands you to sacrifice a cow this is surah baqarah inna allah ya'murukum an yadbahu baqaratan Indeed, Allah has commanded you to sacrifice a cow, which by complete accord indicates that well-known animal. So if I say cow, you know what a cow is. Um, I don't need to refer to it in part or by attribution. If I say um, an animal that eats grass, oh, that could be very vague. I could be referring to a goat. Right, but I'm using a specific term here to, to indicate by its whole, and I say cow, so you know what a cow is. Hence, any member of that species would have sufficed in fulfilling that divine mandate. However, the children of Israel made the matter more difficult for themselves by asking for specification. And so Allah responded by making the matter more difficult for them. <laughs> they may. <coughs> Logic dictates that you've been told something specific and therefore you introducing something vague or associating vagueness to that demonstrates your stupidity. So sound reasoning tells you in terms of logic, if you've been told a complete, if you've been given a complete term, then that's what it refers to. So if I say a sip of water, then you start asking me, well, what kind of water? Was it brown? Was it black? Was it yellow? Does it matter? A sip of water, you know what water is and you know what the action of sipping is. That's a complete term, but it is by association. So when I say he drank a sip of water, you know what that means and you don't need to probe inquiry further than that. Now, for example, if one sees a distant figure and asks, is that a creature or an inanimate object? And they don't ask for any further information from that. We respond by saying it is human. So the word human in our response is now used to indicate the meaning of creature because they asked, is that a creature or an inanimate object? But you say it is human. So the word human responds to that creature because creature is associated with human. The human being is a rational creature or a rational animal. So when, when someone's asking, is that a creature or is that an object? It's human. Well, it is implied within it because that response is part of it. It's part of that whole. Another example is if a physician tells his patient, you need more vitamins in your diet, so eat more fruits and vegetables, whereby he informs the, the patient by partial accord that those foods contain vitamins. So though he's using a specific term in this and you need more vitamins, 
he tells you eat more fruits and vegetables though these two are distinct terms there is a partial accord a link between the two so when he's telling you eat more fruits and vegetables implied within that is that these fruits and vegetables have got vitamins ergo if you eat fruits and vegetables you will also be consuming vitamins with that so that's a partial accord now okay so concomitance or necessity or necessary Concomitance refers to a quality customarily or logically associated with a word, yet not embedded within its complete or partial meaning. So the words that are used there, the terms that are used in that third category are not there in the primary category. So if I say reading and writing, that's not included in human. If you take the word human and expand it, you don't find reading and writing in the word itself. Even within rationality, it, there is no reading and writing in there. But I am associating that by ability to say that the human being is a rational animal and this rational animal can read and write. For example, the meaning indicated by human is a rational creature, animal, rational animal. Yet the qualities of being receptive to knowledge or able to write are customarily associated with a human of sound sense and faculty. So if one asks, for example, is that creature receptive to knowledge and able to write? And we respond, it is human. So if someone asks that creature over there, can it read and write? And I say, it's human. Then there you go. The logical answer has been given. Or the answer is logical in that sense, because customarily we have established that only humans can read and write. Though not logically established, but customarily we have established that only humans read and write. So we respond, it is human. Then we have used human to indicate those two qualities, which it does so by concomitance, by necessity. It does so as a necessary attribute, meaning has the ability to read and write. Not everyone can read and not everyone can write. Not everyone can read and write, but as a potential in the human being, being a quality that they can execute, the human being has the ability to read and write. Another example is an even number, which by concomitance indicates that it is divisible by two without a remainder, a quality that is now logically associated with the term even number. So this is a logical, uh, it's logically uh, established. If you take an odd number and then you take an even number and you divide the odd number by two, you're going to have a remainder. If you divide the even number by two, you won't have a remainder. So if I speak about a number that is divisible by two, then by association, you know I'm referring to an even number. I'm not referring to an odd number because that has been logically established. So certain things can be customarily established as qualities or attributes, and certain things are logically established as qualities or attributes. The indication of meaning by concomitance is a powerful tool in rhetoric and therefore used very often in the Quran, such as, for example, if you pardon, overlook and forgive, then Allah, verily Allah is all forgiving, most merciful. This is uh, 64. This should be in Surah Al-Taghabun. Surah Al-Taghabun, I believe. وَإِن تَعْفُوا وَتَصْفَحُوا وَتَغْفِرُوا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ that statement has got the, the uh, it's a conditional statement, but it's also a syllogism. And inshallah, we'll come to syllogisms. There's a middle premise there that is omitted because the statement is implied. So he's saying, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you forgive and you overlook and, and you let things go, then indeed Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. Now, if you look at that in the translation, it doesn't make sense. But if you understand the, the way it is articulated, the rhetoric that is being applied there, he's saying essentially that if you forgive, overlook, and let things go, then he will forgive you and overlook and let things go. Why? Because he is all forgiving, all merciful. You see? So that's the middle premise that's removed. And, uh, and there are many such examples in the Quran. It's, it's a very powerful tool in rhetoric, in, in articulation. Um, not, not unnecessarily repeating that which is obviously implied. The most 
The best example that I like to look at is in Surah Yasin, because Al-Farabi, when he was asked, Al-Farabi, we, we said it was considered the second father of logic. So when he was asked, you know, if you were to meet Aristotle now, the founder of the science, what would you say to him or what would you ask him? And Al-Farabi said, I would ask him about this ayah in Surah Yasin. Um, who is going to bring these bones back to life when they're gone, they're, they're dust? Qul, say to them, The one who did it the first time will do it again. So in there is an implied, the, the, the middle premise is omitted from there because it's implied and it is established both customarily and logically so you, over here we've got two parts to this right you the there is the customary association what's known through years and years of understanding it's just established that that's the norm of it and then what's logically uh, determined both of these are included in this ayah that there is a customary aspect to it and there is a logical aspect to it as well that when someone does something the first time, they have already within them the potential to do it again. Whether or not they do do it again, or whether or not it comes out the same or better or worse, that's a semantic. But the fact that they have the potential to do it the second time is already in them. So, for example, you, you cooked a, a dish, you made something for the first time, and it turned out you know, amazing. And uh, so you try to replicate it again, but then it doesn't turn out as good. Well, that doesn't matter. But the fact that you did it the first time, even though there was no prompt or there was nothing there, the fact that you did it the first time and you succeeded in doing it, in completing the task, and, and you did it to perfection, the, the potential to do it again is already within you. And this is why, يُحْيَ الَّذِي أَنْشَأَهَا أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً the one who did it the first time, he can do it the second time. So, because Allah is all forgiving, all merciful, if you forgive and be merciful, he will forgive you and be merciful on you. Hmm. Where was it? So it indicates by concomitance that Allah will forgive you and have mercy on you if you pardon, overlook, and forgive. This meaning is not explicitly stated in the ayah. Yet it is implied by Allah's being all forgiving and most merciful in that he would recompense those who pardon and forgive with his own mercy and forgiveness. That's that third piece, the one that is in association. Now, the term, what time do we have? Okay, maybe 10 more minutes, inshallah. <coughs> the term, the uttered word. So, you have to remember that there are three, there are three things that we are looking at. There is the, the term, what we are calling a love, the love, which is the term or the uttered word. Then there is the kalima, which is the word. So the term and the word, these are two different things. And then there is the concept, the tasawwar. So you have got love, kalima, and tasawwar. Tasawwar is the concept in the mind. The kalima can be applied in any language. It's just a word. It's just a word, and it can be used in any language. The term is the most crucial piece here, because when you're speaking with someone, when you're reading an argument, when you're engaging with someone, any whatever it might be, you're not dealing with words, you're dealing with terms. And this is very important because people get hung up on the word and they try to look for meanings in the words. The word can be applied in any sense. For example, I can take the word apple, okay? It depends on how I use the word that will then convey what meaning I intend. So 
I could be referring to an Apple Macintosh. It's not the same Apple as the one that fell off a tree. I could be saying, or, or it, the same thing doesn't apply to, let's say, the apple of the eye, right? I'm using that in a different sense. So the word apple can be used in all these different settings. What matters is the term that is applied contextually. That's what he means by loves with dalla. The love, which is the term and what it signifies. What is its signification? Bill Wadi that has been that has been posited has been made ready for that meaning bil mutabaqa by correspondence to reality. Thus, the uttered word is the term now. The love is the uttered word. So the word is the kalima. That word, the word is, it can be applied in any language and it can be applied in any semantic. It can be because it's just the symbol. And what, what meaning you then associate with the symbol is what gives it its, its signification now. Otherwise, it's, it's empty, it's hollow, it's just a word. So in the context in which I use it will determine what meaning that word is signifying in that context of usage. The word is not the thing itself. You have to remember that the word is not the thing itself. It is not the concept of the thing and it is not the meaning of the thing. It is just a word and can be applied. It's, it's basically in the public sphere. You see, it's just out there and can be used anywhere. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, In hiya illa samaytumuha. In hiya illa asma'un samaytumuha. These are just names that you have given things. This is how the modern world operates now. It's just words. You know, all these strange, strange concepts that come up and these arguments that they present and it, it sounds like they're being very intelligent but they're they're really they're not because it's just a whole you know spaghetti of words that they throw here and there and they give these words symbols their own meanings they they come up with them but deep down ultimately when you condense it they don't mean anything they're useless words what really applies here is identifying the term and this is why when you get into a discourse a discussion, a debate, or a conflict, whatever it might be, and there is a misunderstanding that is arising, each individual has the right to ask for the definition of the terms. What do you mean by that term? What do you mean when you're saying that? What does it mean? Because they're using a word, maybe they're not using the proper definition of it. That definition can take on multiple forms. Dictionary definition, what 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 a word denotes this is these are called haqaiq um, uh, al-lugha what, what does it denote what is its dictionary its basic fundamental or rudimentary definition and then haqiqa shari'iya then there is shari'iya amma shari'iya khasa haqiqa majaziya metaphoric usage am and then khasa specific then there is haqiqa uh, urfiya uh, uh, the the orf usage of it, the tradition or the customary use of it, even that has got its khasan and its anman. So the same word can have all these different realities in which it is being utilized. And you have to understand in what reality is it being used so that you can then arrive at the essential meaning of that term. <clears throat> Then the form, the surah, so that was the love and then the kalima, and then you've got the surah, the form. This has got to us because reality or existence, there are two parts to it as far as the human being is concerned. Is concerned. There is wujud kharij, which is the, the, the tangible reality, the external reality. And then there is wujud adhihni which is your your conceptualized reality so if i say unicorn for example the unicorn has got these two realities there is a 
reality in terms of the concept of it, then there is a reality in so far as the world is concerned. Then in the world, there is going to be the, the Vahiri, Wujud Vahiri, and then meaning a physical object, which the unicorn does not have a physical reality, but it has a reality in language, in a word. There is a word called unicorn. And it can be used in different applications as well. So that's there's a different state of existence. That's the surah. The surah of a thing, its name and its conceptual meaning are three different things. The concept in the mind, the word that is associated with it, and then what the word means are three different things. This is very important to grasp as a Muslim because the secular world does not believe in these things. They don't believe that meaning ex exists outside of language. F to them, everything about, re about meaning is tied to language itself. And as far as they're concerned, the English language. And this is why they, 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 they praise that. They raise that in a higher... If you speak English, you're considered an educated civilized individual you speak any other language you're considered to be you know village uncivilized so if you speak arabic there's already a picture painted you are either some dumb stupid arab wealthy blowing money off or you're a terrorist one of those <laughs> you see if you speak the any other language you're considered to be uncivilized and unfortunately this has seeped into many many cultures so you know like in the indian subcontinent Apparently, if somebody speaks English, they are, they are higher society. You know, if they use English terms, like if they use English slang, for example, they're considered cool. But if you use traditional Hindi or Urdu words, then you are somebody who is probably from the village or somebody who's old fashioned, you know, prior century thinking, Gandhi generation. That's, that's the perception, you see. So the secular world does not believe that that meaning exists outside of language because the language construct is a human construct. We've made it. We've constructed the semantic form. But the sound itself goes deep into meaning. And what the sounds mean, we don't know. It goes into another reality. That reality is what gives rise to this reality. That's, that's from the Alam al-Amr. And it gives it gives rise to the alam al khalq. What is what is what transpires in this metaphysical domain is what exhibits or manifests in this physical domain. Al maani qabl al mabani, meaning comes before the construct. The function of an object comes before the form of an object. The form does not determine what its function is going to be. So just because a certain object has this form, that form does not determine the function of the object. The function of the object is what gave rise to that form. That we required something in which to put a liquid. And that's where the form was developed to contain that liquid in there. It's not that we saw something lying somewhere that looked like a glass and then we decided, you know, through billions of years of evolution, came up with the idea, huh, I can use that as a coffee mug. That's not how it works in reality. So the, the, the meaning comes before the semantic form of the language. The semantic form of the language is just a carrier. It's a vehicle a medium, a vehicle, something that carries what it what is the precious entity securely carries it from one position or place to another in space and in time. That's what a vehicle is. You see, the word Araba, Araba in the in the early usage of the word um, didn't mean Arabic or Arab of origin race. It meant language. One of its other meanings was vehicle, not a car. A car is a modern concept or a carriage, something that carries. So in the 
uh, medieval times, they had carriages that were pulled by beasts of burden. The carriage is carrying something in it. It's called a vehicle. It is what's facilitating the motion of taking an object from one place to another place. So in, in, in some language, like in the Turkish language, the word for a car is Araba. Araba is from this word. It's from the Arabic Araba, which is a vehicle. In the Turkish language, it literally means vehicle, though it would be used for many other kinds of cars. So a small saloon will call, be called Araba. Uh, a, a minivan will be called Araba. Uh, even a truck might be called Araba. It's a vehicle. So what does a vehicle do? What's the, what's the associated meaning here in terms of Araba? Language and vehicle. Language itself is a vehicle that carries meaning from one state or one position to another state. It carries meaning from one place to another place. That's what language does. The meaning is put into the word and then the word is placed there. Someone else can come and look at that word and say, ah, okay, that's what it means. And they've abstracted the meaning from the carrier. This is why I say that the word is just a word until it is utilized as a symbol, until it is given meaning or signification now in this case, uttered or spoken or written contextually and then applied, that's when it has signification, that's when it has a purpose. Otherwise, it's just a standing word. Language is, and this is why language for the human being is the cornerstone of civilization. You have this modern ideology that says science is the cornerstone of of human civilization. And that's completely false. It's absolutely false because science itself is a tertiary language. It's a collection of words that come together that give you terms and definitions and descriptions or equations and, and is concise and it's put within a, a, a set of parameters. It becomes a language of its own. That's what a science is. It's tertiary to the actual essence of language and language itself serves as the foundation of the human being. The very medium th through which we understand, through which we realize, through which we arrive at realization. If that's taken away, then there is absolutely no understanding. That's the light. The, the, the understanding, the arriving of, of uh, the, the, the usage of this vehicle to arrive at meaning so that that meaning takes us to the next meaning and then that takes us to the next one and so on so forth until we come to understand the source of it all where has it all come from these are what you call fundamental questions the probing of the mind into reality using fundamental questions what is all this how did it come to be how did I come to be? What am I in terms of relation to everything else and relation to myself and in relation to the origin that I have come from? Who am I? Where have we come from? And where is all this going? These are fundamental questions. These are the questions that unfortunately human beings don't want to ask. People are busy worrying about, you know, the price of tomatoes. And did you hear what happened over there? And, and I don't understand why that one said like this. We are stuck in this dynamics of qila wa qal. You see, he said, she said, kind of. Uh, we're not thinking about these deeper questions. We're not thinking about these higher realities. These are the fundamental questions of probing into reality. These are the questions that help you uncover what this is all about. What is existence all about? What is wujud all about? It's those two fish who are swimming and they were asked, how's the water? And then they looked at each other and they were confused and they said, what is water? He's not thinking about his state of being, his existence. True psychological soundness is to resolve the epistemological crisis within so that with clarity of mind, you can now probe inquiry into these fundamental questions, deep thinking. The secular world has now turned academics and seeking of knowledge into something 
that is reliant entirely on skepticism, which unfortunately defines the thoughts of many Muslims, even when it comes to the Quran, when it comes to this, the words that we're looking at, the alfaz that the Quran is giving. We're thinking skeptically. We project our own skepticism onto the revelation, and then we hope to seek some sort of guidance from that. How does that work? He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa min ayatihi khakus samawati wal art wa khtilafi al sinatikum wa alwanikum. From amongst his signs is that he's created the heavens and the earth. And then he has differentiated everything into tongues, into, into different tongues, different languages and colors. He has differentiated everyone. He's put everyone in different, different categories. This in the, in the, in the style of the Quran is called itbaq where the, the association, because you've got samawat wal ard, al sinatikum wa alwanikum. So al sinatikum is linked to samawat and alwanikum is linked to al ard. So the language is of a higher degree. Complexion is of a lower degree. <laughs> the color is an ardi, is, a, is an ardi thing. It, it is of this domain, the color, the complexion. The language is of a higher domain. And, and language begins with the ism. And this is where he said, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا سَبِّحْ إِسْمَ سَبِّحْ إِسْمَ رَبِّكَ الْأَعْلَى Glorify the name of your Lord Most High. The ism, that's where the word sama, sama the, the word ism, the, there is a debate in, in, uh, yeah, among grammarians whether it comes from the word wasama or it comes from the word samawa. So, so wow, seen, meme, or from the root word seen, meme, wow. It doesn't really matter. They are both of the same uh, root structure of wow, seen, and meme, the three letters, because it's harf illa. So when it is transformed, the wow gets transformed into the alif because it then fills in. So when you look at bismillah, it's actually bismillahi, but then the alif is dropped in there. Anyway, wasama means to signify something, a, a brand or a, cate uh, or, or a characteristic. It's the, it signifies something. That's one of the meanings that derive from that. And then samawa means elevated or raised in a high station. Sama, the sama is raised it. Rafa, it has been. He has raised it. That's the sama. So the samawat are higher in degree. The ard is lowest of the low. So in in that ayah, language is given a higher degree. It's its placement in the in the syntax and uh, not in the syntax in the in the semantic, in the, in the contextual semantics of it, its placement, samawat wal ard wa ikhtilafil al sinatik wa ikhtilafu al sinatikum wa alwanikum. The al sinatikum, the tongues, the language is associated with samawat, with the higher degrees, and the complexion, the color is uh, associated with the lower degrees. And this is why language is of a higher order as far as the human being is concerned. It is the very thing that defines who we are as a creature. You cannot be called rash because this is why the word hayawan and natiq is used. The nutq in there includes both speech and rationality. Even though there is another term they will also use hayawan al-aqil, the intellecting animal. That's what you call the rational animal. But Hayawan and Natiq includes rationality and speech because speech itself is rational. Whether it's intelligible or intellectual is besides the point. Speech itself is rational. It's got a rationality to it. It has a certain order. Each word has a certain designation and an association and a signification. 
I think we've gone way overboard. So we're going to stop here, inshallah. And I hope I hope I was able to articulate this one section well, because that's where it all starts from. If you can understand the word that is uttered, if you can understand its designation insofar as your life is concerned, then a lot of things can easily be resolved psychologically, socially, interactively with your relations. A lot of things can be resolved if you can just distinguish that. Now, it's not an easy thing. I mean, I'm giving you the theories here, but it goes in practice to be able to apply that and to be able to distinguish that. When somebody is saying something, what are they saying? In what context are they saying? How is it affecting you and why is it affecting you? Is it just a word? Is it just lahu? Is it empty words? Is there some meaning associated with it? What meaning is associated with it? How is it being associated? Why is it being articulated? You need to be able to ask these questions and probe reality. You have to have an, an, an you have to have a question to ask. The next question, the moment you stop asking questions, it means you've either understood everything or you've understood nothing of it. So let's stop here, inshallah. Next week, we're going to do the, uh, the five universals. You'll understand better what the, what the love means because it has its classifications now. You'll be able to identify, is it a genus word? Is it a species? Is it a differentia? Is it, uh, is it specific? Is it accidental? What is its classification? And what does it mean when it's somebody uses it in a certain way? So we'll look at those five universals next week, inshallah. Let's stop here, take a quick break. Um, what time is Maghrib? Do we? So in five minutes? Okay, so so we'll meet back in about 10 minutes or 15 minutes, inshallah, after Maghrib. Or after Maghrib for me. Jazakumullah, alhamdulillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Let's get started, inshallah, and finish before salah. Jazakallah, Ustad. Uh, anyone who wants to ask a question, please uh, raise your hands in the chat box. You guys can ask your questions as well if you want. You can write them down if you want. And I guess I start everyone understood everything today. Okay. <laughs> your question? You can ask you can ask your question. Saying that is self satisfaction the same as keeping the mind active. Is is uh, self satisfaction the same as as keeping the mind active? The mind the mind is always active regardless of the state that the being is, whether awake or asleep, old, young, whichever. Self-satisfaction is parted into two, into two categories, you could say. One in which the self is self-satisfied by itself. The other in which it is satisfied in a way that it is the heart that is content and that the self is harmonious with the heart's content. So there, these are the three types of selves. An nafs al amara bisu, an nafs al mutmainna, an nafs al radia, and an nafs al mardia. Ah, sorry, an nafs al lawama, an nafs al amara bisu. And then an nafs al mutmainna, and then an nafs al mutmainna is includes an nafs al radia and an nafs al mardia, and then the, then you have nafs al kamila. 
So a nafs al-lawama is the self that is indulged in 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 so in in evil or as inclined towards evil inclinations. Those are the vices. So remember that vice and virtue is proportioned within the soul, within the self. Fa'alhamaha, fujuraha, wa taqwaha. He has proportioned the soul with vice and with virtue. Qad aflaha man zakaha wa qad khaba man dasaha. The one, the, the successful one is the one who purifies it from its virtue. And the loser is the one who prevent who, who puts an, a wedge decides to put a wedge in between the heart's natural inclination because the self the soul is a vessel for the heart so the heart is in there it's a vessel for the heart and so if the soul is journeying towards other than the siratul mustaqim heading towards the divine presence then it puts the self the being in a state of self uh, injustice that's the dasa so you're preventing yourself and you're preventing yourself by doing all these actions by putting blemishes on the heart by 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 aggravating the diseases of the heart then there is nafs al-lawama that is in a state of lament or lamentation the guilty conscience the self that is condemning itself i did something wrong I shouldn't have done that. Then tries to rectify things after some time ends up doing the, doing it again. So it keeps on bouncing back and forth. Then an nafs al-mutma'inna is now the self that is harmonious with the heart's content. And the heart itself is aligned with the law al-mahfud. So Imam al-Ghazali said that the heart and the law al mahfud are mirrors to each other. They just need to be aligned to face each other so that what's reflected in one mirror is reflected in the other mirror, parallel reflection. So when the, when the heart is aligned to divine ordinance, which is what law al mahfud contains, then the heart finds contentment and the soul should be in harmony with that, i.e. the sultan's directive, leadership, the city is adhering to that. The politicians, the defense forces, all the subjects, they're all working to fulfill the command and the leadership of the Sultan, which is the heart. And the Sultan wants to align himself with the divine ordinance. That is Nafs al Mutma'inna. And from that, you've got Nafs al Radiya and Nafs al Mardiya. So the soul that is pleased with itself in terms of having achieved this harmony and the soul that is itself pleasing to the creator and so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ya ayyatuha nafsul mutma'inna irji' ila rabbik radiyatan mardiya o you soul that is now content return back to your lord pleased and pleasing fadkhuli fi ibadi Come enter amongst my righteous servants and enter into my Jannah, my paradise. That is the soul that is self-satisfied in a higher degree, a transcendental degree. Not satisfied in terms of this worldly aspect. So an individual, even though they may be engaging their mind, their, their mind is active, they are trying to pursue things, to do things, but their intentions are not aligned with that kind of contentment their intentions aligned with worldly contentment you know it's just fu continually fueling the, the self so their active indulgence is activated towards worldly pursuit the things that they are doing are feeding the self not really sustaining the heart so the mind is still active and the actions that they're doing because again remember actions are contingent only on the intentions so if the intentions themselves are faulty then the actions though they may be righteous actions they are contingent on faulty intentions so once again an individual cannot say that i'm satisfied with myself i'm pleased with what i have achieved in terms of my ibadah i've done my salah well 
I've done no the one who the Salik is always seeking to make it better to make it more to perfect it better to be more cleansing of himself because he knows that he is in a world of constant push and pull turbulence and so he is still going to continually encounter all these circumstances that are going to keep drawing him away from the right path they're going to keep alluring him away from it Iblis said I'm going to come for, to them from the front from the back from the right and from the left and you will find most of them are going to be ungrateful for your mercy for what you have given them this ability that you have given them most of them will be ungrateful the ulama said on that as an ishara he didn't say that he will come from on top or from underneath he said he'll come from front back right and left from this horizontal plane this worldly plane because from above comes revelation and guidance and below is a station that iblis will never take to go below the human being because that's a station of humility it is a station that where you prostrate and put your nose on the ground that's a station of humility so long as the human being maintains this upright position i.e his niya is sincere and it's honest and it's virtuous then what he then occupies himself with externally is going to generate more and more benefit from him not material benefit but this spiritual benefit that will keep the heart content that's when you can then say the self is satisfied in a higher and a transcendental state i hope i answered your question this i now start uh, there is another question mm -hmm. what kind of form is salah if the heart is remembering allah but the body is physically tired and let's say cold does the intention count how does one gather the courage to get up on a cold night for prayers especially if there is much physical work to do throughout the day the above mm -hmm. question is in context of the form in the essence wrapped in physical actions or body well that's what you call mujahada that's the jihad that's the struggle right it's it's not it's never going to be easy to win the battle so this is the battlefield this world is the battlefield sometimes the conditions are favorable to win the battle sometimes everything is against you or, or, or whatever you might your ammunition has run low you don't have any weapons you don't have food you don't have this and you still need to fight the battle so that's the real struggle that's what distinguishes the warrior from the foot soldier the 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 the, the strong commander and the leader from those who get pushed around like pawns so this is where now you go into a different sort of a dimension what you call things like willpower that inner strength to push you out i hope that uh clarifies uh, shakila you may please unmute yourself and ask the question assalamu alaikum warahmatullah alaikum salam warahmatullah i have three questions Mm -hmm. So the first one is, uh, could you, would you define this Ilmul Kalam? Come again? Ilmul Kalam, the definition mm -hmm. or like my understanding is that like pre preserving the D by words or by, I don't know, uh, this is something like, but I need to know like what is Ilmul Kalam? Ilmul Kalam is, is the science of discourse in theology. That's essentially what it is. Kalam is discourse, argumentation. So it was it was developed partially as a necessity and partially as a mode of uh, intrigue. Because at that time now, Islam was growing and spreading out. And you had Persians coming into Islam. You had Indians coming into Islam. You had Chinese coming in. You had the Greeks, the Romans to a degree, the Egyptians, and all these civilizations that had a rich background and a rich tradition in their own sciences, in their own understanding of religion and their own philosophies. And so this sort of probing of inquiry into really the nature of God was the fundamental piece of argument. 
And many of these arguments were coming in that were very, very faulty and very dangerous, incredibly dangerous. And the schools of thought that were developing from it were, you know, they were tearing the Muslim ummah apart. There were great fitnas that were taking place. One of the most famous are the, is the fitna of the Mu'tazilites. The, the Mu'tazila, they had developed a school of thought that was basically a purely rational school of thought. Basically, everything was rational and their condition of understanding religion was based on what rationality determines religion to be. Basically, they would sub subject the Quran to human rationality. And if it made sense, then they would take it. If it didn't make sense, they would cast it aside. So. You can imagine now when you start going into the deeper aspects, what sort of issues this could create. So the tradition produced its own um, mutakallim, mutakallimun. And these were individuals who studied all these other sciences. They studied this, the philosophies and they were able to now come up with arguments that would counter these uh, false claims. It's also from this that you started getting all these refutations taking place, refutations against Greek philosophy, um, against Aristotelian logic, like Ibn Taymiyyah's Radda al um, you have Imam al Ghazali's Tahafut al Falasifa, and then many other refutations that took place that would analyze all these arguments and then um, clarify what are the good things and what are the things that are dangerous from that. So that's what Ilm al Kalam really is. Now, Ilm al Kalam is a very, very advanced science, and it's not something that I would recommend anyone to just blindly go into. There are many requisite sciences that have to be mastered before you go into Ilm al Kalam. And it's very unfortunate. I've seen many Muslims, they go directly into this field, you know, they start getting into these theological debates and arguments, and they've got no training whatsoever in these fields. And they come up with all these YouTube videos and channels and they call them da'wah and all these things, which is, it's not da'wah. Anyway, but that's what Ilm al-Kalam is. Ilm al-Kalam in a short is theological discourse. Yeah. Do, yeah. do you see that this is, the time is also coming or something like what they did in the past. Now we are coming on the same, same type of time or uh, that we need this, uh, Yes, yes, definitely. We do need Imam Al Ghazali. Actually, he made many refutations against the Mutakallimun, but then he also said that it is necessary for select individuals in the Ummah to be trained in these sciences so that they can preserve the, you know, the core aqidah and the and the structure of the religion against all these argumentations. We definitely need this because. It may not be the same that's being repeated, but it's definitely on a higher intensity now because we have such a an exponential growth in the flow of information that it is virtually uncontrollable. You were you basically cannot trust anything that passes through this information mainstream. I'm, I'm not saying mainstream media. I'm saying the mainstream of information, Internet, WhatsApp, this, that and the other, whatever. You can't trust anything that comes across. I've seen many, many things. People do postings and put up all these things that they think they're being religious or they think that they're giving something of virtue, but it's fundamentally flawed. And some are borderline blasphemous and many are actually already blasphemous if you analyze them. Uh, okay. And unfortunately, there are no people who are being trained in this. Hmm. Yes. Okay, so I, I will move to my second question, and that is related to today's topic, and it's about concept, word, and meaning. So my understanding is this concept is something that we comprehend, and that is something inside our mind, uh, the understanding mm -hmm. of a thing itself. And then the word is something that signifies to that uh, thinking or comprehension that we have in our mind. Mm -hmm. And then you said the meaning. So does the meaning mean the thing itself that has been signified by the term or the word or what no, the meaning the meaning is different from the thing itself the meaning is different the concept is different and the word that associates them is also different they are th these are three different entities so the object is different what it means is different and the word that i will associate with this is different 
And then I put that out of your view and the concept formed in the mind is different. So if I say glass of water, you have a concept in the mind now. That concept yeah. is different from this because the, that's in your mind, right? This is over here physically. And then glass of water as the word, that's different. Yeah. So, right, that's different. Now, what does it, what does it do? What is its definition? It's a vessel in which contains fluid or liquid that can be used for drinking. All that is different from glass of water. The definition and the term are separate. And it's different from, but they are all tied together. And this is what we are calling correspondence. They're all linked together. How, is the, that meaning we are, is, yeah. mm -hmm. How the meaning is connected? Like, uh, is it the definition or what is meaning? No, the meaning is what you, 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 you know it to be, what it is. What, what does it mean? That's not something that you can articulate in this outward world. You cannot give it form. Meaning has no form, shape, has got no um, dimensions. It's just it. It just means you just know it. And concept is something like the same. But how does concept differ from meaning then? The concept is the form. Like if I if, if I speak about okay, something, got it. You sort of picture it in your mind. Got it. Right? Got it. Yeah. That's what you're picturing in your mind. But what it means can or cannot come out into this world this world is not a world of meaning this outward world for example if you you love your children okay that love that love has a uh, has a signification you cannot show anyone that love you cannot give it any quantity you can't say it weighs 20 grams you can't give it any dimensions you can't give it measurement it doesn't occupy space it is of a completely different realm altogether, but you can articulate it. Now, how would you articulate that love? You will have a form in your mind, an image. Maybe you will see your children in, 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 in your mind and you may be able to articulate it in a certain way. How much do you love them? Or you could tell your children, I love you both or I love you. You see, so that's you articulating it that's the word taking form now externally so the meaning and the form in your mind are separate they are distinct the yeah. the form in the mind is of an intermediary realm in between because it's in the mind the mind is in the in between of the alam al amr and alam al khalq is the outward world so this is in the in between he says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sanurihim ayatina fil afaqi wa fi anfusihim hatta yatabayyana lahum annahu al haqq we will show them our signs on the horizons and in their selves until it becomes clear to them that he is the truth or it, the who can also be referred to as the message the, the Quran that it is the truth but the truth itself if you notice, he doesn't say it will become manifest externally in this world. He says he will show them the sign in themselves and on the horizons. Now, what's the horizon? The horizon is the meeting place between the sky and, and, the, and the earth. Between the Samawat and the Ard. Between that and that. But they never touch together. They only seem like they're touching. This is the in-between and the soul has been placed also in this in-between realm. Between the realm of, of the spirit, so the ruh on that side, and then the realm of the body, the mulkia. So this is the mulk now. The, the ruh is from the malakut. The soul has been placed in between the two. So it can interact with the spiritual side and it can interact with this physical side as well. The sign he says he's going to show them we will show them our signs in themselves so the sign comes in the in between that's the symbol now that's in the in between of these two domains so on this side of the domain you have the the physical entity on this side of the of the of the domain you've got the the meaning the in between is where the association takes place so the word is what enables you to associate. Language is the carrier now. It's the vessel, the vehicle that carries one from this station to that station. 
the bus leaves from here, comes here, goes from here, goes there. Carries. So the, the language, the word, the constituent of words, these are where the symbols are, the signs are, though that's the, the unit of language. And what the mind does is it uses that to associate that physical object with the what it means in order to understand it, because the physical object cannot come into the spiritual domain of the heart of the of the ruah. And the meaning cannot come into the material domain of the physical object. You can't bring that in here. So you need an intermediary, something that will translate what that is into a carrier. And then that carrier can be brought out into this world. So when I'm speaking, the words I'm using, that's coming out in the form of sound. And I'm saying mm -hmm. sound. You can hear sound as a physical object. There's the word sound. And then there is what that means. I can't tell you what that means. I can give you a definition. I can give you a description. I can give you something, measurement, item, whatever I can give you. These are all significations of what that is. But what it is really in reality that I cannot explain it to you. I just have to understand it myself and you just have to understand it internally. Okay. Okay. So what I understand is like meaning is from the Alim <clears throat> Amr and that yes. actually through the carrier of a mind or a concept comes into the physical world that is the alam e khalq Yes, yes, correct. Okay. My, now my third question, and that is related to at uh, You mentioned an ayah uh, from Surah Rum, it's 22. So here, like uh, at is, uh, as I know, it's like uh, opposite words. Uh, like two opposite words mentioning. So here I understand like Samawat and Earth. So it's like opposite of each other. So uh, could we take this al uh, sinatikum like the languages and the colors as the opposite of uh, each other or something? Sort of, yes, you can do that. But it's it's basically that uh, it's a technique that is used in articulation. So I can say, for example, um, we went to the masjid and to the restaurant we prayed and we ate so i went to the masjid and to the restaurant prayed and ate so naturally you know there that the praying is associated to the first term to the masjid and then the the eating is linked to the second term which is the restaurant so that's essentially it's a way of articulation yeah but okay, the so two are not they could be linked. Yeah. Yes, exactly respective or association yeah. in that Okay. Yes. Okay. Because when I, I read, so it's like uh, when, when you say like Vama Yasta will ama wal basir. So it's like blind and and then uh seeing wala zulumatu wala nur. So it's like the darkness and the light. Uh and what yeah. yeah. are like this. Yeah. Yeah. They could be opposites, they could be non-related, like I said, masjid and, and restaurant. Huh. Generally okay. also not related in that sense, but I can say that this is what I did today. I went here and I went there. That's what relates the two together. They don't necessarily have to be opposites, but in the sense that when he's speaking that, when he's giving you that, you know that Samawat and are, are opposites. They're not mm -hmm. the same. And therefore those two that are associated respectively are also opposites in that sense. Okay. Jazakallah khairan uh, for all the replies. And it just come by mind, the fourth one, but I will just stop there. Uh, so is this the reason of uh, reading this logic together with this hikam to be in control of mind, not just going for the logical side? And then it just come in my mind when I ask this question of kalam, ilmul kalam. And then you said uh, it was maybe it's a possibility to be going on one side. So is it the reason of reading this uh, uh, logic with the hikam. Well, that yeah, that was the idea was to to show that because the the concept, well, the way we are studying it, we're studying it from a psychological lens, from from as in we're studying it under psychology. So the idea is to use logic and the self to establish sound thinking and sound uh, intellection. That was the that's the whole idea. Yes. Okay. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards you immensely. I mean, Assalamu I mean, alaikum. Jazakallah. Uh, Ziva, you may ask the question. Two, two more questions and then we're done, inshallah. Yes. <clears throat> um, Assalamu alaikum. Um, Basically, Ustad, um, 
all right so you know i've got two questions sorry about that but um uh, for this first question i don't know um i don't know if it's related but i might be confusing myself by thinking about it so you know when you mentioned about um loved and the galim and the sower um it made me think about this argument in psychology um i remember my teacher um going through it um ages and ages ago like four years ago no I, sorry i don't remember anyway if, if language comes first or if thought comes first um, i'm just wondering what do you think of this because um one one argument was that thought comes comes before language because um you know a kid they um they think about things and, and, and I mean the concept of things first and then they in turn um, no they they then it they basically acquire language afterwards and and then the other argument was that uh, language comes first um because it's they no I forgot the other oh, oh, no yeah they internalize they internalize things and then they um come up yeah they no sorry wait the language they internalize language and then they come up with concepts meanings yeah so th there's argument that language about thought or language coming first so i'm just wondering what do you think about this okay let me ask you a question if a child is hungry let's say the child is a year old uh, or six months old or two days old and they're hungry are they going to tell you they're hungry or which what word are they going to use to to express their hunger what's coming first in this case thought wait um it's, it's is it is it the is it the thought that is coming first or is it the word that's coming first I, do they uh, feel the I hunger? think his language is nonverbal. Oh, I'm getting on the spot right now. <laughs> no, it's it's know. not. I'm not on the spot. Wait, I think I do know. So, the infant is going to cry, and it's going to express a certain sense or a certain emotion internally um, that they require sustenance. But they don't know what sustenance is. They don't know what food is. They don't know what hunger is. They don't know the concept yet. All they're doing is associating a certain sensation and they're expressing that sensation. But they cannot express the sensation using words because they have not yet acquired language yet. So when you look at these arguments, you have to first question the definition of the term that is used in the argument. What do they mean by language? Because there are two types of language or there are two aspects to language. Technically, there are three, but let's look at just these two. There is the semantic form of language, and then there is the essential form of language. The semantic form of language is the physical word, what you will call English, you'll call Arabic, you'll call Urdu, you'll call this one, your mother tongue, this, that, and the other. That is the semantic form of the language to say, I am hungry. The word I and am hungry, these are semantic forms. The essential form of language is an internal communication that's taking place. The fact that there was a sensation that was generation, uh, gen generated, there was a sense that took place, and there was computation that took place in the mind, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the brain, to recognize the sensation from which an actuation then took place to express by crying that that signifies that there is a pain that i am going through and the mind is cognizant of that that's an internal language that is taking place that's the that's what comes first it is from that that the thought is then generated and then from the thought comes a perspective in urdu you'll call it andaza the perspective is generated well, how do you see the world now from that perspective comes a cultivation. You act on that perspective accordingly. From that, from that cultivation is where now civilization takes place. You are either going to be civilized or you will be jahil. 
uncivilized, how you will inhibit the world. Between the essential form of language and the perspective, the world view, between that you've got the thought and the semantic form of language. So essential form of language, concept and thought, and then semantic form of language. That language will influence your thought. So the language around you, you could be sitting in a group of people who are all um, mute, dumb, they cannot speak. And yet you will be able to communicate with them regardless. So the semantic form of language is a semantic, but still you are able to influence each other's thoughts. There is a different kind of language that is now taking place there. That's the conceptual language. If an individual comes to you and is from a foreign country, does not speak the language that you speak, they can still express to you what it is they want. If they're hungry, they can point to their mouth and point to the stomach and do like this. And you know that they're hungry, they want food. How are you able to determine that? They're not speaking your language, you don't speak their language. The semantic form is third party. There's an essential form in there of language and that's the concept. You understand the concept. They understand the concept of hunger. You understand the concept of hunger and you're able to communicate with them. This is what the mind is doing. This is the first section of logic. This is tasawwar, grasping the concept or abstracting the, the, the fundamental essence of a thing and what it means. So that even the physicality of it is not there, you can still understand each other. If I say this is a glass of water, if I ask you in English and you said this is, what is this? You say it's a glass. If there's somebody speaking Arabic and I ask them, Mahiyatun. And then they say, Tilka hiya zujaja. The word zujaja and the word glass, these are semantic forms. Now, it doesn't matter if you call this zujaj or you call this kubun or you call this glass whatever you want to call it is a semantic form but you have the concept of what this is this is something that i mean your question is very valid that's why i'm taking so much time in explaining this because the academics that we're going through today i it's very corruptive and i mean you have to be very careful because these are things that the secular world cannot explain can, they cannot explain this. This is why they conclude with saying, oh, you know, the, the thought comes first, the language comes later. And so they don't give the language any meaning. Uh, and, you know, they, for them, it doesn't have any meaning. Like in modern linguistics, you have a theory called the ding dong theory. They say that phonemes are useless. This, the a, the a, the ba, the ka, the sa, the da, all these phonemes, these are useless. They're just sounds that we're making. But the Quran tells you, no, these have meaning. And these meanings go deep into a metaphysical reality. And they have an influence on, on your psyche, on yourself, on your spirit. Um, because if you bring in the evolutionary theory, for example, to say, okay, the language, the thought comes first, the language comes later. Well, for the evolutionary theory, pre-modern man was an idiot, was dumb. They didn't know anything. They were just ooh, ooh, ah type people. So where did the concept come from? The, the, the fact that we are asking questions, this idea of question and answering, the idea of probing reality, where did it come from? Explain that evolutionary to me. How, how did that happen? Where, which part of the brain evolved to, to bring about that concept of asking questions? The, like the concept of what a question is. How does a human being know? Like you know that what a question is. You know that we're in a question and answer session. You know what a question is. You know what an answer is. Where did that concept come from? That's that internal language. That's what comes first. And that's what influences the thought. This is why وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا does not mean he taught Adam, gave Adam a list of uh, names like a dictionary in the Arabic language and, and told him that this is called this, this is called that. That's not what it means. It means the concept is what was primed into the human being to have a conceptualization of the universal tree 
and the universal pen and the universal the universality of things so that when he comes into this reality now he's able to look at things and associate them to that other reality that he came from which is the reality in which that essential language exists i hope i hope i'm making sense uh, that this is why i wanted to focus more on this part of the love because you really need to grasp this initial premise this is an axiom if you grasp this everything else is going to be very easy for you it's going to come like this because it's just a matter of getting the terms right the rest of logic is going to come immediately to you grasping this initial piece here of the concept the essence of language not the semantic form of language the essence of it this is where everything else is going to fall into place you want to learn a new language it will come like that you want to learn and study another science it will come like that once you grasp this piece. But language is what comes first. Essentially, this is what you should know. In, in our tradition, we always believe that al ma'ani qabla al mabani, meaning precedes the form, the construct of it. So the physical construct or the semantic form of language is preceded by another language, which is the essential meaning that comes before the physical construct. Hope I answered that correctly for you. Yeah, Ustad, that's really deep. And I, I think it's all making sense now. I'm not sure if I can ask my second question because there's someone um, someone else that asked a question in chat. <clears throat> yeah, Is it going know. to be a question because it's now Maghrib type for me? So I want to kind of wrap this up. <laughs> Maybe yeah. we can continue. You can follow up your questions next week, inshallah. Yeah, that's can we? no problem. Yeah. Inshallah. Let's 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 conclude here for now. I'm sorry. I know there are more questions, but it's Maghrib time for me and I'm already quite late. So maybe we can continue. Please hold, you can hold your questions and then next week we can you can bring them up again. It will be excellent for sort of revisiting or revising um, today's session. And, and, and I have no issue whatsoever. If you feel like you want me to repeat today's session once again, and I'll be more than happy to do it because, like I said, if you grasp this initial piece, the rest becomes easy. So if you would like me to redo this session again so we can do more questions on that also, please uh, let me know, inshallah, I will I will come back to it again. Yeah, so let's let's end here, inshallah. Subhanaka wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samiyun alim. Wa tuba alayna ya maulana innaka anta tawabu rahim. برحمتك يا رحم الراحمين بارك الله فيكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته جزاكم الله خيرا. Oh, um, please, uh, uh, Saif, could you save those uh, uh, questions that maybe are in the chat uh, so that they don't get deleted? <clears throat> ah, yes, and, uh, uh, sure. Anyone who wants to ask any questions, you just send the messages over to me on Telegram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll compile yes. all of those. That's perfect, actually. Yeah, send your questions to Saif and then he will compile them for next week. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.